So very warm welcome to those who are tuning in to this podcast. Uh, I, my name is Luke Huddy and uh, on my right, co-hosting this morning, I have the veteran media personality, Wayne Turner. Thanks for having us in your uh, studio, Wayne. Uh, thanks. It's an absolute pleasure. And sitting across from me is none other than Andrew Selly, who leads the 412 movement and is recognized <coughs> by many to have an apost- apostolic grace. Welcome to the studio, Andrew. Oh, thanks, Wayne. Lucky to be with you guys. Right, so where do we kick off? So we're actually going to be starting the first podcast this morning of a series, um, which we are calling Be Equipped. Um, And as the name implies, we're going to be uh, just equipping the saints and the leaders in 412 churches um, with some resources. And this morning, we're going to be focusing on specifically the skill of reading our Bibles and interpreting them well. Um, so we're going to actually be picking up on a little nugget that you dropped the other night at um, Church Planters Training, okay. which is always, which is also on uh, a po- podcast format. So uh, anyone listening to this could actually go and hear it uh, firsthand. But you were talking about, um, I don't know if you used the phrase, but a kind of fridge magnet uh, Christianity where you take a, a, a favorite scripture of yours and uh, put it on your fridge and claim it for yourself as a kind of prophetic um, promise. And you were you were actually sharing on the danger of that and how that's actually not always a responsible way of interpreting scripture and applying it to our life. So maybe you want to just elaborate a little bit on where do Christians go wrong? Maybe you could give us an example of how Christians sometimes do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge problem within the Christian church, especially in the charismatic church, which we would yeah. fall under. Uh, you know, people have got this thing, like you say, they'll find a scripture that really kind of means something wonderful. They'll take it, apply it to themselves and, and own it. And I think the big problem with that is that the Bible is written by a personal God to people in unique situations. Right. And, um, you know, the challenge is... It's like a father talking to one child. The other child can't apply everything that the father says to the one to the yeah. other because there's, the father's dealing with something unique and specific there. Mm. And so when God deals with his people throughout history, there are unique situations that they're facing and unique scenarios that they are having to deal with. And uh, and so Christians can't just take a, something that God says to person A and apply it directly into person B. We yeah. can learn about what God is like in what he's saying, but we can't necessarily apply a promise that he makes to one person to myself. And an example of that would be, for example, um, uh, let me just think, in uh, one of the famous scriptures would be Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now that is a wonderful <laughs> promise. And so every Christian slaps that on his fridge or kind of holds onto it, owns mm. it as his own. But again, we've got to put that into context. What is Who's God speaking to here? He's talking mm. to Israel. He's talking to Israel at a specific point in their life. And actually, he's about to take Israel into 70 years of Kept up captivity in Babylon, they're literally going to become oh slaves. And and so what he's saying is because they've been rebellious, yeah. he's actually now going to discipline them. And the point is when you're being disciplined by me, I want you to remember when you're in slavery mm. that I actually do love you, that I actually yeah. have got something still for you. And so uh, he says the plans he has to prosper them are going to ultimately be fulfilled, but for the next 70 years, which is pretty much the rest of your life, if you're hearing that promise, yeah. you're going to be a slave in a foreign nation. And so to take that as a as a promise to me and apply mm. it in a way that it wasn't meant is not healthy because obviously that's not God we apply we literally taking that to mean something that God didn't mean it to mean. Yeah. And just before that in Jeremiah 18, God says to the same people, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for your destruction. Oh dear. And you think, oh my goodness. I haven't seen that on a fridge yeah. before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you've got this real challenge where God is dealing with a, a rebellious people and yeah. he's about to discipline them. And then he says, when I'm disciplining you, remember that I love you. That's basically what he's saying. We take that like God wants to bless me now. And, you know, God is going to ultimately work out life for my blessing. But if you are not obeying him, the challenge is you could be hearing that first part where the mm. Lord says, I know the plans I have for you. I've got plans to discipline you, chastise you, and in this case, using Babylon. So, again, to take something just as a bland promise that God makes to somebody or something that God says, 
we've got to be very, very careful because we can actually make it mean something that it really doesn't mean and okay. gets us in a lot of trouble. So what you're saying is that all those beautiful promises of the Old Testament specifically, you know, when we have a quiet time, we, we chat mm. about, or we read about uh, a particular promise. It's that little section and mm. we think, oh, wow, that's my verse for the day. I'm going out every place I put my foot, I'm going to claim and all the rest yeah. of it. I mean, you yeah. can equate that, and, and yeah. but yeah. you can't take that as a direct promise. So, no. the, so the whole Bible is not written to everybody. No. I mean, it, you know, the other thing is God's dealing with people over, over the ages uniquely to bring about his will. And so in Israel, in the Old Testament, God is establishing a nation. They're going to be the equivalent of the church today, but they are going to be given physical land. Israel is going to be their inheritance. And when they obey him, God promises to bless them. When they don't obey him, God says, I'm going to bring your enemies against you in persecution and lack of peace to bring you back to repentance. And so he's saying that to them. But when he establishes the church, he doesn't promise us land on this earth. He promises us a home when we die that he's preparing a place for us. Yeah. I go to prepare a place for you. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Yeah. But you, you bring an important point up there where you say, because many people believe that, okay, in the Old Testament, it's the Jews. So that must be for us now as the church, you know, that whole church, mm. uh, Jewish thing. Mm. So people will use that mm. to say, well, because it was said to the Jews, and now we are the church. It can yeah. apply to us, but that's not so. Not at all. We we distinct people, you know. While we've both been grafted together into Christ, or we need to be grafted into Christ to be saved, the Jews were something that God was doing. Israel was something God was doing in the Old Testament to establish a people for himself through whom the Messiah would come, through whom the Gentiles of the world would come to see him uh, and would ultimately come to know God. And so God is kind of progressively building his case. And uh, when it comes to us in the New Testament, we we are not, like I've said, we're not promised a land. We're not promised the boundaries that God gives Israel. We don't mm. live in Israel. I don't have an inheritance there. I have a spiritual home like Abraham, and I have a home that I'm when I die, I will be with Christ and God will recreate the world and I'll be a part of that part of what he's doing. And so the promise for me is different from Israel. In fact, in Israel, it's funny enough, when, when Israel is rebellious, God says, I'm going to bring destruction or, or lack of peace, basically. Uh, but to the church, he says this, actually, when we are obedient we are persecuted because Jesus said, blessed are they when they persecute you because they persecuted me. And so in Israel, when they were persecuted, it was a sign that they were doing badly generally and they were being rebellious. But in the New Testament, when we were being persecuted, it's a sign of the blessing of God, which is why the disciples considered it a joy to be counted worthy of suffering for the gospel. So again, when God says, I want to bless you, bring, you know, bring peace to your land, it means something different to us to how, what it meant to them. And so the church really does mess us up a lot and we end up with a very bad theology about how life works, where our value system is because we don't understand that God is speaking to us uniquely yeah. in a different way to them. So if we had to now take that scripture which you mentioned, because I think in terms of fridge magnets, that's probably number yeah, one. Number one <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, it's but, on my iPad cover. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know what to say. That to that. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord has a, an appointment for you this morning. <laughs> we'll uh, talk afterwards. <laughs> so the, uh, that scripture, which is, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord plans mm. to prosper you, to give you a future. So you mentioned that the principle that we would take out of that, considering the context that it was spoken into, was that even though the Lord was going to discipline them, mm. and even though the Lord's going to discipline us, mm. um, we mustn't interpret that necessarily as God's angry with us. Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Um, sorry, just lost that again. So, so the principle behind that particular scripture, because that was a promise given to Israel when they were about to go into exile. You were yes. saying, and he, God was actually reassuring them that even though you're about to be punished, I have good plans for you. Yeah. And so for us as New Testament believers, now when we read that, what would it mean for us in terms of what principles could we take from that very well-known right. verse? Great. Well, I mean, there's a few just off the top of my head. The one is that God doesn't delight even in the death of the wicked. God actually is good and he does want to bring favor and blessing yeah. to us. He loves us. And so at the end of the day, no matter what we're facing, even if it is a captivity, we can remember that God loves us, yeah. um, that he didn't promise us, certainly as Christians, a life without difficulties and troubles. Yeah. Again, in the Old Testament, he did promise them that. He said to them at that time, if you obey me, I will yeah. bless you. He doesn't promise us that. But I can see the goodness of God then in the new covenant, even in difficulties and trials, that the principle here is that God 
wants good for me. Yeah. He does love me. He's a good father. Mm. And so we can hold on to that concept of that thing without applying the the exact literal, yeah. you know, how does it work out for them? That's how it's going to work out for me. Totally. Because if we do that, we're going to get our hurt. We're actually going to get hurt. Our mm. faith will get damaged because it's not rooted in the truth. Mm. It's rooted in a misunderstanding of God and his ways, how it applies to me. And that's mean I would be disappointed with God, which means I might actually end up damaging my own faith yeah. and, and maybe even turning away from him. Because it also results in cherry picking, doesn't it? Because yes. like you mentioned, there's a verse that's almost identical, but it ends very differently totally. with uh, plans to destroy you. So we're not being consistent in how we are reading the Old Testament. Right. We're taking what we like right. and we're applying it to ourselves and we're actually ignoring the ones we don't like, right. which is not why God gave us the scriptures in the first place. I, I yeah. think we're all ch classic cherry pickers. I think yeah. we've all done that through our early <laughs> years. We pull out what we think is right for us when, I mean, often it is, yeah. Yeah. but often it's... Uh, yeah. For someone else. You know, one of the key things also here is God was speaking to unique people then, and he still speaks today. Yeah. And he speaks today not just through the scriptures. He does speak through the scriptures, but, but, but he speaks by the Spirit. He says, my sheep will hear my voice. And as New Testament Christians, we have access to God. And we, you know, we are to hear him. We're to hear what he mm. says to us personally. And the danger is when we begin to apply principles into how we're going to hear him about it. You know, the Bible says that I believe it, therefore it's true. Mm. We get ourselves messed up because we, we've got to, we can apply, we can see something of the ways of God in this. But we've got to learn how to interpret it properly and realize that it might apply uniquely to me to how it applies to you. We are different and God deals with us uniquely. Uh, two children in the same family will be brought up very differently by the same father because they are unique. And I think God deals with us uniquely. And so for me, I, I was thinking in John 21, for example, Jesus says to Simon Peter, uh, that basically he's going to crucify him. He says, uh, you know, I've chosen when you're old, you're going to go where you don't want to go and, you know, men are going to string you up basically mm. to do what you don't want to do. And, and Peter knows that Jesus just told him you're going to be crucified. And so Peter turns around and says, well, what, what about, about John? And Jesus says, what's it to you what I've chosen for him? This is what I've chosen for you. And I think we've got to realize that there is a uniqueness to what our Father does in us, that we have to apply for ourselves and hear for ourselves. And because God says that Peter's going to get crucified, doesn't mean I'm going to get crucified. And because God says to John that he won't be crucified, that he'll live to an old man, doesn't mean I'll live to be an old man, because God has unique ways that he deals with us. And we have to hear him by the Spirit for ourselves. And mm -hmm. yes, the Scripture can speak to us, but we must be careful of of of, of of misappropriating or misapplying the text mm. and trying to take it then as a promise to us. If you look at the New Testament, can you apply something similar? Because those uh, books, like Paul, mm. he wrote specifically to the Philippians. Mm. Now, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's that's great. I mean, yeah. it's a principle that's there. Mm. But we still got to realize that the, the Bible wasn't written to us. Totally. It was written to specific people, and so often they cut it at be, before Matthew, and they say, "Well, that's we can understand that," and they're halfway there. And in the New Testament, that's everything in there for all of us, for everyone, for all time. But again, so what you're saying is, even when we read the New Testament, we need to be 100%. careful. Well, I mean, and even that scripture, I've seen that you know, uh, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I've seen Christians apply that scripture in ways that even it wasn't even written to Paul, or you know, Paul didn't say it, um, in, in the sense that. You know, I've seen people that are athletes and I can run up this hill through Christ who strengthens me or I can succeed in business through Christ who strengthens me. And that's not what Paul's saying. Wasn't he in prison? Yeah, Paul's actually so, writing that. Literally, <laughs> he's literally writing it from prison. He's literally writing it saying, I've been rich, poor, beaten, shipwrecked. And he goes on and then he says, but I I can do all things. I can I can come through all things mm. even though Jesus I'm in, gives me strength. Even yeah. though I'm in prison, that's even right. though I'm being persecuted, that's even right. though I'm in dire situations, right. I can. So it's not... It's not like I can make anything. Otherwise, what, what can I fly through Jesus? Because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So that promises when you're in prison. It, it, it's basically. If you really want to take yeah, it to the bottom. Yeah. And another one I'll apply. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. It's interesting. I, you know, we believe in the gift of the spirit and we believe that, you know, God still moves today with the miraculous and healings. And certainly we can see people that have been healed miraculously through prayer and, um, and even raised from the dead. I know personally of people that have been raised from the dead. Uh, through prayer, which is amazing. But Christians then apply something that God said to a unique group of people at at a time, and they make it a promise for all of us. So Jesus said, the only time in the New Testament says that anyone will raise the dead, actually, is Jesus said to the 12 apostles, he sent them out at one point, and he said to them, I'm giving you authority. And he says, go drive out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. That's the only 
time in the New Testament that we are told, anyone is told by God, that they were raised the dead. That's to the 12 apostles at a unique time. Can we apply that that now we all are going to raise the dead as a promise to us? No, because it's actually written to them at a unique time. And it's actually what Jesus is saying is the king has come to Israel after thousands of years of been waiting. This we need to de- God wants to demonstrate that I am who I am. And so there's going to be a demonstration of the kingdom and the power like Israel has never seen and probably never see again because the king has come. And so to show that the king has come, there's going to be miracles unprecedented. You, you, we, we, and in the history of the world, there have not been miracles like they were at the time of Jesus. In 2000 years, no one has calmed storms. No one has uh, walked on water. No, one, These are things that are unprecedented. And so there's something at that time that God's doing. Bringing that through today, can I take that as a promise to me that I'm going to raise the dead? Mm-hmm. No, I can't. But is it possible that I might be able to raise the dead? Of course. Mm. The Lord might at, at a unique moment come upon me and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead does live in me. Mm. And so God could actually raise the dead because he, he does that kind of thing. But I can't take a promise made to them and then demand it and, and own it to something to me. I have to keep in step with the spirit myself, believing that God can do more than I can dream or imagine mm. and keep in step with what he's doing. So tell me, uh, we're obviously now talking about interpreting scripture in a healthy mm. way, in, in the way God intended us to mm. actually read it and understand it. So uh, now you, something else you mentioned on that evening is that um, God can sometimes take a scripture which was for a specific person in a specific situation. And the Holy Spirit can make it applicable to you so that it actually becomes a promise for you. Do you want to maybe share a little bit more about that? The Lord definitely speaks and sometimes he speaks through scripture. And and actually sometimes he speaks through scripture to me as an individual out of context. Yeah. In other words, he cuts the context out and he takes a line that he said to somebody else. Yeah. And and so, uh, you know, for example, I remember years ago, MC, my wife was barren and, we were trusting, well, the Lord said that he was going to give us a child and she was praying and we felt that she might have fallen pregnant. And she went to the Lord and said, I want to hear from you mm. whether I'm pregnant. Mm. And, you know, just speak to me. And she flipped open her Bible, which you're not supposed to do. <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and should we be sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as she opened up her Bible, it was like a part that was just highlighted. And I think we've all experienced that time where yeah. you read the Bible and it's like suddenly this is to you. It's like the Holy Spirit is taking us to you. Mm-hmm. And it was God settles the barren woman happy in a home with children. And she came out and said to me, I'm pregnant. And I said, how do you know? That God's told me. Well, she was pregnant, and sure. my daughter's now thirteen years old. Wow. Uh, and that was something God spoke to her specifically, in a scripture out of context. That's not what He's saying to Israel. Yeah. He's not saying to them they're going to have a child like mm. this. He's, he's, a, a confirmation. Yeah, it, it is. And so I think for me, there are definitely times that God can speak to us individually, but we need to do that and hear Him by the Spirit. Yeah. And realize that then the scripture might be out of context, but mm. that's okay. Mm. It's a personal promise to me. It's not something mm. I'm going to teach others on because mm. it's something the Father said to me uniquely. And it's not like you mass produce producing that phrase for people no. everywhere to no. put on their fridges no. to claim for themselves. What God says it's to something me is he not, spoke to you. what he says to you. Yeah. And, and so if he says that to me and I believe it, that's great. I have a relationship with him. And again, yeah. you know, he said he would send the spirit who would, who would speak to us, who would lead us, who would guide us into truth. So mm. the spirit of God can speak to us even out of the scriptures. And dare I say, even in the scriptures, out of context, yeah. in a verse, but it's something that he says to me specifically. Mm. And I think then it's for me. That's yeah. what the Father said to but me. But those instances, I've had them over the years. Mm. Those are miraculous. Mm. I mean, it really blows you away. You think, how can you open it at that time? And God speaks to you. Yeah. But that's God using his word to speak to you personally. It's not a general. Yeah. Uh, and, and it certainly, it's again, it's it, it probably falls more into prophecy than mm. under uh, the word of God. Yeah. And so it's something that I need to test because it's not, I can't say the word of God says it yeah. because the word of God didn't say that actually. The word of God was saying something else. Mm. I felt the Lord spoke to me prophetically out of yeah. that scripture. So it's not the scripture says, it's uh, it's my, I think I heard the Lord say that to me. I mm. believe God spoke to me that way. And so it doesn't have the same authority or weight as it was when the word of God literally says that. And we need to be careful to, yeah. to nuance those things properly. So you would treat it like a prophecy because you wouldn't weigh scripture up to see if it's accurate or true because we know it is. But a prophecy you treat differently. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the scripture, there's certain principles we apply to uh, and and you can't break those Mm. principles. But prophecy is something that needs to be tested. And so if the Lord speaks to you prophetically out of the scripture, it then isn't the scripture, it's prophecy. Mm. And and so then I, I you know I can test it because we prophesy in part we you know mm. we don't we, the prophecy is not a complete picture and at best it, it might be too much pizza 
Yeah, it really. Yeah, how do how do I hear the Lord? I, I need to test that word. I need to have confirmation of that word from the Lord. Yeah, and then believe it when I believe He's spoken to me uniquely and individually. You, you can't be dogmatic. You can't have all these things. This and have everything nice little boxes. No, Christians tend to want to have everything like a promise box. You pull that's out right. the one in the morning, and that's, that's right. for you. I mean, that's those right. are scary. Those little pr- promise boxes because yeah. some people actually act on 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 what it says. But I mean, it. I think. Fridge magnets, it's great to have it there as a reminder, like in the Old Testament, you put a pile of stones to, of God's glory and his provision, not for you personally, but it's nice to have those displayed. Mm, it reminds nice. you that you serve a gracious, amazing, miraculous God. So we, we, we're not saying throw away all these fridge magnets, but how you use them. Mm. And we certainly can learn about God through the fridge magnets. We just can't apply that principle directly. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see when God says in Jeremiah 29, you know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. We can see that even sometimes when we are taken into difficult times, mm. that the difficult time doesn't negate the fact that God loves us. In fact, I would argue mm. that who can separate us from the love of God can heart, depth, breath. I would argue that that's the New Testament version of the Old Testament, Jeremiah 29. Mm. Sure. You know, they're going into a time of persecution and must that's be wondering what is going on here? Why are mm. we going into these times? Are, are we in rebellion? Are we are we being punished by God? And and and. And, and the letter is no, you know, nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. As mm. long as you remain in Christ Jesus, you remain in the love of God. Uh, so nothing can separate you from that love. And I sure. think that's a, a wonderful promise for us. Even if we go into 70 mm. years of captivity, it might be an illness. It might be just financial difficulties. Yeah. These are things that we're not promised we're going to always have victory in. Yeah. Um, the Bible says only when Jesus returns will those things be fully dealt with. Mm. God can heal now, but he might not. Whether he does or he doesn't, <laughs> he's, so that, he's so it's a beautiful him. parallel that you drew there between nothing can separate mm. me from the love mm. of God with I know the plans that I have yeah, for you. It's like yeah. the New Testament it equivalent. Yeah. I want to um, ask you now a little bit about something else you mentioned when I first he- heard you speaking on this topic, which had to do with Proverbs. Mm. Uh, now, obviously, Proverbs is a book in the Bible, but there are many truth sayings like Proverbs, even not in the book of, 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 of Proverbs. Um, and the example you used, and you can use that example or, or any other one that you think might help, but was, um, you know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And people taking a scripture like that and not really distinguishing between a principle mm. and a promise. Um, could you maybe share a little bit more about that? It, yeah, again, we've got to realize that different at different times and at different books of the Bible, God is doing with different things. Mm. And so when it comes to wisdom literature, which is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and arguably Job, there is a, and Song of Songs possibly, there's a feeling of um, um, the wisdom of God, the ways of God starting to be shown. Now, again, we need to be careful when it comes to the ways of the Lord, because in the garden in Genesis 3, uh, man's falling and Satan comes to him and says, um, <laughs> that if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. You will have the knowledge of good and evil. And so one of the core ingredients of a fallen man is that he wants to be like God. He wants to be able to live autonomously from God. Mm. And how he does it is by learning the ways of God, knowing good from evil. If I can know the ways of God, then I can apply them and live autonomously from God. And I can get the system to work. I can even get God to work for me, which is actually part of a fallen nature instead of a faith nature, trust mm. nature. And so often Christians then, that's part of the reason we, we're discussing. That's why we get in trouble. Yeah. But these books specifically, Proverbs, for example, you know, train up a child in the way that it should go and when it's old, it won't depart from it. There is, there is here something that God instructs to us to do. Mm. And what he's trying to help us understand is generally the rule will work out, that this is how it will work out. In other words, uh, if you do this, the likelihood is pretty hard yeah. that it's going to be that. Mm. And so God's not saying if you train up a child when they're young that when they die, they necessarily are always going to yeah. live in the boundaries you put on them. Mm. He's putting a principle out there, a general kind of rule mm. that um, if you bring up a child in the way that it, it should go, you train it well, yeah. um, the likelihood is that that child will end up coming back to the things you taught. Now, we see that in life. Yeah. We see that we often do come back to these things. So, But to make that a promise is going to get you in trouble mm. uh, because that's not what that scripture is saying. Mm. It's it's giving a general rule, and, and it's really encouraging the parent to train up the child. Mm. In, other words, if, in other words, I'm trying to encourage you that you would make a good point of training up your child well here. There are promises or actually commands about training up children 
uh, you, know, you think of God speaking to Moses and he tells them to train up your children in the ways, you know, uh, and right through the Bible, parents are told to train up a child. So there is a command on us to train up a child that goes yeah. beyond the book of Proverbs. But there is a principle then that we can try and hope for. And that mm. is that the child will one day return to that, to the, you know, to the things that we've put upon the child. I think the danger is when parents start to make the principle of promise. And, uh, and that's when you start to get in a lot of trouble. And so the Proverbs is written to kind of give us, you know, generally this is how life's going to work. If you do this, which you should do, the first part, mm. the likelihood it's going to do this. If you sleep with a prostitute, sorry, if you sleep with a prostitute or uh, you know, an immoral woman, the likelihood is that your life is going to fall apart. Yeah. It's going to get difficult. Mm. That's how it works out. So but there are exceptions as well. And... There are exceptions. And that's that's uh, Job. Job is the classic exception to that. Job mm. is doing everything right. I mean, he, there's no one more righteous on the planet than Job. God even says he's righteous. And so he should walk in blessing because Proverbs says, you know, I've never seen the, 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 the children of the righteous suffer. Or, yeah. And then Job's children are killed and he's righteous. So you go, whoa, hang on. Proverbs just kind of, you take it as a promise. Well, then that didn't work out for Job yeah. the way it's supposed to, because he lost his children. He lost his wealth. He lost everything. How could God bring this to Job? And in fact, it's funny, the book of Job, Job's friends are basically applying Proverbs wisdom to him. They're the falling book. into this very trap. The trap and they're going, about, yeah, yeah, Job, you know, you, you, you've done something wrong because your life would not be this horrible mm. if you were walking right with God. And he keeps, you know, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And they, no, 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 you can't. It's like 40, 40 something chapters of you wrong, Job. Yeah. And then finally God breaks in and says, well, actually, I'm God and you don't understand my ways. So don't presume to think you know what I know. Were mm. you there when I created the heavens? Do you really think you're going to understand me? And then Ecclesiastes comes in, and that book is about, um, I've seen, I don't understand this, basically, because I see the children of the righteous starving, and I see the children of the blessed being blessed. All life I, is of the funny. Getting blessed in life. And so you've got this, at the end of the day, you end up with this thing of, God is bigger than our understanding. We know, There's general ways that he works, but mm. he's so much bigger and wiser than we are. Our faith is in God, and we can't hack into the system and try and you know, get everything to work out the way we want it to because we're only human beings. God is God, and he does what he wills, and he says, my ways are infinitely higher than yours. You can learn a bit about who I am and what I'm like, yeah. but don't think you can control me. Don't think you do this and I will be forced to do yeah. that. And that's something that we need to bring through into the New Testament. That's something that's hit the church over the years. Yeah. where people are almost saying, God, you said this in your word. I command you to do it exactly. because you have said it. Exactly. And what you're saying is God can change if he wants to. He's, you know, he's, it, it, he's totally, sovereign. Totally. He does what he does. And he says, you know, lean not on your own understanding. <laughs> and you think, whoa. And even your understanding of the scriptures, my ways are infinitely higher than yours. And so there's scriptures that we can hold to that we can learn about who God is and ultimately what he's like. But we can't necessarily understand exactly how he's going to apply our situation, what mm, he's going to do. Yeah. There's, a, there's a broadness here that we hold on to God and we believe in God even when we don't understand. Maybe um, one sort of closing question. It's, it's kind of like the opposite extreme, which is something I've heard people say, which maybe you can speak into, which is to do with principles mm. and proverbs. Mm. Uh, so then people would maybe say, well, if it's not a command, then are we obliged, are we obliged to obey it? Mm. Uh, well, what would you say to that uh, that's out of the coin? You know, the, generally the Proverbs are, are made up into the first part and the second part. The first part is the wisdom of God. In other words, God says, train up a, train child. Up a child. And so that's something that if you don't uh, do, you actually, you're actually sinning. You, yeah. you, 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 we're supposed to reflect him and his ways. Mm. And so we must distinguish between what are we supposed to do? What is mm. God saying to us to do? Train up a child. Mm. And then hope and hope that the outworking of that will work out the way we should, the principle will work out that way. Yeah. We are bound to the first part, but the second part we can hope for and yeah. hope that God will honor that what we've done and um, and brings through favor and blessing. And I yeah. think it's very careful. Otherwise, what parents do is they then say, well, then should I train up my child? Yeah. Is that then? And then you go, well, no, no, of course you're supposed to train up your child. The scripture is yeah. full of that. Uh, it's only the, pro the, the, here, the, the promise or the principle that we can not be that sure of. But mm. generally, it's wisdom. Mm. And generally, the rule will be this. If you bring up your child in the ways of the Lord, when they're old, they'll probably turn to him. That's the general general. Yeah, rule. that's very helpful. I think we'll probably have to uh, call it there. But I wanted to just say thank you so much for 
this time together. I, I, I know for me personally, and I know for Wayne, particularly illuminating, you might have to yeah. take that uh, screensaver <laughs> off uh, after this way. But uh, I wanted to just... Yeah, the, the one, that one you said about uh, the Bible says it, I've had my old Bible cover as well, so I think I'm going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a few things. So thanks so much for your Great. time, and I, and I hope that this won't be the last... Uh, the, uh, kind of equipping of this kind of how to re read and apply our Bible in a responsible way because I think and this is I know something you've said very often it, it's, it's a skill learning to read your Bible well is a skill which is not as common as yeah. it should be uh, and so I hope that this can really bless those that uh, listen and thanks so much great man. thank you <laughs>